Chapter 9 I wandered for several days in the woods and made attempts to approach the villages. The first time I noticed people running from one house to another, shouting and waving their arms. I did not know what had happened, but it seemed wiser to stay away. In the next village I heard shots, which meant that either partisans or Germans were nearby. Discouraged, I continued on my trek for another two days. Finally, hungry and exhausted, I decided to try the next village, which seemed quite enough from the edge of the forest. As I emerged from the bushes, I nearly walked into a man plowing a small field. He was a giant with enormous hands and feet. Reddish whiskers covered his face almost to his eyes, and his long, disheveled hair stood up like a triangle of reeds. His pale gray eyes watched me warily. Trying to imitate the local dialect, I took it, told him that for a place to sleep and a little food, I would milk his cows, clean the stables, take the, the beast to pasture, chop wood, set snares for game, and cast spells and all kinds against human and animal ills. The peasant listened carefully, examined me, and then took me home without saying a word. He had no children. His wife, after arguing with some neighbors, agreed to take me in. I was shown a sleeping place in the stable and told my duties. The village was poor. The huts were built on logs, plastered on both sides with clay and straw. The walls were sunk deeply in the ground and supported thatched roofs crowned with a chimney made of willow and clay. Only a few of the peasants had barns, and these were often built back to back to save one wall. Now and then, some German soldiers from a nearby railroad station came to the village to take any food they could find. When the Germans were approaching, and I was too late to run to the woods, my master hid me in a skillfully camouflaged cellar beneath the barn. Its entrance was very narrow, and it was at least ten feet deep. I had helped dig it myself, and no one else, other than the man and his wife, knew of, it, of its existence. It had a well-stocked larder with large lumps of butter and cheese, smoked ham, strings of sausages, bottles of homemade liquor, and other delicacies. The bottom of the cellar was always cold. When the Germans rushed over the house searching for food, chasing pigs in the fields, clumsily trying to catch chickens, I sat there absorbing the delicious fragrances. Sometimes they stood on the board covering the entrance to the cellar. I used to hold my nose to avoid sneezing as they listened to their strange speech. As soon as the sound of many army trucks died in the distance, a man would pull me up out of the cellar to resume my usual duties. The mushroom season had begun. The hungry villagers welcomed it and went to the woods for their rich harvest. Every hand was needed, and my master always took me along. Large parties of peasants from other villages roamed the woods in search for small growths. My master realized that I looked like a gypsy, and anxious not to denounce to the, to the Germans, he shaved my black hair. When going out, I put a large old cap on my head and covered half my face. It made me less, it made me less conspicuous. Still, I felt uneasy under the suspicious glances of the other peasants, so I tried always to stay close to my master. I felt I was sufficiently useful to him to be kept for a while. On the way to mushroom gathering, we crossed the railroad running through the forest. Several times a day, great puffing locomotives passed, pulling long freights of freight trains. Machine guns thrust out of the roof of the cars and rested on the platform in front of the steam engine. Helmeted soldiers scanned the sky and woods with binoculars. Then a new kind of train appeared in, on the line. Living people were jammed in locked cattle cars. Some of the men who worked at the station brought news to the village. These trains carried Jews and gypsies who had been captured and sentenced to death. In each car there was two hundred of them stacked like corn stalks, arm raised to take up less space. Old and young, men, women and children, even babies. Some of the peasants from the neighboring village were temporarily employed on the construction of the concentration camp and brought back strange tales. They told us that after leaving the train, the Jews were stored into a different group, then stripped naked and deprived of all their possessions. 
Their hair was cut off, apparently for use in mattresses. The Germans also took looked at their teeth, and if there were any gold ones, they were immediately pulled out. The gas chambers and ovens could not cope with the great supply of people. Many of those killed by gas were not burned, but simply buried in pits around the camps. The peasants listened to these stories thoughtfully. They said the Lord's punishment had finally reached the Jews. They had deserved it long ago, ever since they crucified Christ. God never forgot. If he had overlooked their sins of the Jews so far, he had not forgiven, forgiven them. Now the Lord was using the Germans as his instruments of justice. The Jews were to be denied the privilege of natural death. They had to perish by fire, suffering the torments of hell here on earth. They were being justly punished for the shameful crimes of their ancestors, for refuting the only true faith, for mercilessly killing Christian babies and drinking their blood. The villagers now gave me an even darker look. You gypsy Jew, they yelled. You burn, yet, bastard, you will. I pretended that this did not concern me, even when some shepherds caught me and tried to drag me to a fire and toast my heels. It was God's will. I struggled, scratching and biting them. I had no intention of being burned in such an ordinary campfire when others were incinerated in special and elaborate furnaces built by the Germans and equipped with engines more powerful than those of the largest locomotives. I stayed awake at night, wondering, worrying whether God would punish me too. My parents always went to church on Sundays and sometimes even took me to my nurse. Was it possible that God's wrath was reserved only for people with black hair and eyes who were called gypsies? Why did my father, whom I still remembered well, have fair hair and blue eyes while my mother was dark? What was the difference between a gypsy and a Jew, since both were dusky and both were destined for the same end? Probably after the war, only fair-haired, blue-eyed people would be left in the world. Then, what would happen to children of blonde people who might be born dark? When the trains, carrying Jews, went by the daytime or at dusk, the peasants lined up at both sides of the track and waved cheerfully to the engineer, the stroker, and a few guards. Through the small square windows at the top of the locked cars, one could sometimes glimpse a human face. These people must have climbed on shoulders of others to see where they were going and to find out whose voices they had heard outside. Seeing the friendly gestures of the peasants to the people in the car must have thought that they themselves were being greeted. Then the Jews' faces would disappear and mass of thin pale arms would wave desperate signals. The peasants watched the trains with curiosity, listening intently to the strange humming sound of the human throng, neither groan, cry, or song. The train went by, and as it pulled away one could still see the dark background of the forest, disembodied human arms, waving tirelessly from the windows. Sometimes at night people traveled to the crematories, would toss their small children through the windows in hope of saving their lives. Now and then they managed to wrench up the floorboards, and a determined Jew might force their way through the hole, hitting the crushed stone, track bed, the rails, or the taunt semaphore wire. wire. Slashed by the wheels, their mutilated trunks rolled down the embankment into the tall grass. Peasants wandered along the tracks at daytime, would find these remains and quickly strip them of the clothes and shoes. Gingerly, lest they get soiled with diseased blood of the unbaptized, they ripped the linings of the victim's clothes and searched for valuables. There were many disputes and fights over the loot. Later the stripped bodies were left on the track between the rails, where they were found by the Germans' motorized patrol car, which passed one, one day. The Germans either poured gasoline over the contaminated bodies and burned them on the spot or buried them nearby. One day, word came to the village that several trains with Jews had passed at night, one after another. The peasants finished their mushroom gathering earlier than usual and all went out to the railroad tracks. We walked, 
along the line of both sides in single file peering into the bushes, looking for signs of blood of the signal pole wires and on the edge of the embankment. There was nothing for a few miles. Then one of the women spotted some crushed branches in a thicket of wild roses. Someone spread the thorny ground, and we saw a small boy of about five sprawling on the ground. His shirt and pants were in shreds. His black hair was long, and his dark eyebrows arched. He seemed to be asleep or dead. One of the men stepped on his leg. The boy jerked and opened his eyes. Seeing people leaning over him and tried to say something, but pink froth came from his mouth instead and dripped slowly over his chin and neck. Afraid of his black eyes, the peasants quickly moved aside and crossed themselves before he could have time to count their teeth. Hearing voices behind him, the boy tried to turn over, but his bones must have been broken because he only moaned and a large bloody bubbles appeared in his mouth. He fell back and closed his eyes. The peasant watched him suspiciously from a distance. One of the women crept forward, grabbed the worn shoes at his feet, and tore them off. The boy moved, groaned, and coughed up more blood. He opened his eyes and saw peasants, who darted out of the field of vision, crossing themselves in panic. He closed his eyes again and remained motionless. Two men grabbed him by the legs and turned him over. He was dead. They took off his jacket, shirt, and shoes and carried him to the middle of the track. He was quite visible to the German patrol car. Could not miss him. We turned to go home. I glanced back as we went. The boy was lying in the whitish stone of the track. Only the clump of his black hair remained in view. I tried to think what he had thought before dying. When he was tossed out of the train, his parents or his friends no doubt assured him that he would find human help which would save him from the horrible death of the great furnace. He probably felt cheated, deceived. He would have preferred to cling to the warm bodies of his father and mother in the packed car, to feel the pressure and smell the hot, tart odors, the presence of the other people, knowing that he was not alone, assured by everyone that it was all only a misunderstanding. Although I regretted the boy's tragedy, at the bottom of my mind lurked a feeling of relief that he was dead. Keeping him in the village would do no good to anyone, I thought. He was threatening the lives of us all. If the Germans heard about a Jewish foundling, they would converge on the village. They would search every house. They would find the boy. They would also find me in my cellar. They would probably assume that I, too, had fallen off the train and would kill both of us together on the spot, punishing the whole village later. I pulled the cloth cap over my face, dragging my feet at the end of the line. Wouldn't it be easier to change people's eyes and hair than to build big furnaces and then catch Jews and gypsies to burn in them? Mushroom gathering was now a, dar a daily chore. Baskets of them were dry drying everywhere. Basketfuls were hidden in lofts and barns. More and more grew in the woods. Every morning people dispersed into the forest with empty baskets. Heavy laden bees, carrying nectar from dying flowers, droned lazily in the autumn sun, through the windowless peace of the thick undergrowth, guarded by the towers of tall trees.